We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you another episode of We Can Help with Dave and Woody, already in progress. To the sky, fly like an eagle. Hey, yeah, hey, yeah. what's I had to acknowledge we're recording once again? No, but yeah, I didn't get to finish. But that's why cups are round. Hmm. Never thought about that, did you? Not till just now. Right. I mean, we could drink it. I mean, sure, there's a few cups that come square and unusual shapes, but cups are round. Things we drink from are round. Hmm. And yet forks and knives are... Yeah, I always said, yeah, well, forks and knives are are not round. I don't know why they would be. But uh, do you think if the Eastern world had come up with a fork and spoon before the chopsticks, they would still use chopsticks? I argue they wouldn't. Because they're better? Right. The fork and spoon are uh, so much better. Well, that's that's a tough argument to sell to. So the the argument, oh, you know, people that want to use chopsticks, I'm like, come on. We all know the fork and the spoon are far, far more efficient and better than chopsticks. Why we continue to play this game? I don't think the chopstick is so much a utensil of of delivery. I think it's more like a shovel. Well, it's like a spoon. Well, it's not a shovel. Oh, let me back up. Good point. It's not a shovel. That that would be the spoon. So it's more like a pusher. See, when they when I've noticed that the I have to be careful how I say this. When folks that use chopsticks, they hoist the bowl up to their mouth and right because because they're not eff- efficient. It, yeah, they don't work. I mean, that's a funny story. Well, it's not funny, but I'm going to tell I, it anyway. Just to I was going to laugh very hard. Well, <laughs> when we were a little bit younger, my wife and I were members of a yacht club. We were a little hooty out. Yeah, the 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 Florida Yacht Club, in fact, down in Jacksonville. Did you have a yacht? I had a Lincoln Town Car. <laughs> yeah, it was a yacht, land yacht. <laughs> I swear, I had a Lincoln Town Car. The guy goes, "What kind of boat you got?" Right up there in, <laughs> Spot number nine. <laughs> anyway, um, I wasn't there for the boating. It was the drinking and the food. But anyway, so we're at dinner one night, and my daughter, my oldest daughter, is dating this fellow. And I'm not going to pick on him with this story, but um, please, my wife and I kind of grew up similar circles where we're our parents. My mother, we used to say, had delusions of grandeur. She had like 24 pieces silver set sterling. I thought we were living in the Edwardian age. I had to polish all the damn silver. Um, so I knew all the pieces and how, which forks and the knives to eat. And so did she. Salad like. forks. and the, Yeah. Uh... She grew up in that kind of same household. And so this young fellow that was dating my daughter at the time, we brought them all out to dinner. And um, salad came along and he picked up, I think, a dinner fork. He picked up his dinner fork. Oh. And he's, you know, the humanity. (laughs) And he started to go for the salad with the dinner fork. And I was like, oh, this is going to be good. And uh, so Sheila goes, what are you doing? He goes, I'm getting ready to enjoy my salad. (laughs) He goes, no, 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 no. You don't use that when you use a salad. You use that fork. And his response was, why? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I, 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 this is not making fun of him. I think he's brilliant. So I, I set my fork down <laughs> and I pulled back in the chair and I went, yeah, Sheila, why? I mean, I knew the answer, but I was like, this is going to, you know. Well, you don't know why. Good. There's no why to why no, you use a the smaller answer. fork. Yeah. And so, I went, yeah, do tell. Please tell us why. <laughs> and so she was just like. Oh. Enlighten us. <laughs> yeah. She was just melting down mode. Like, no, you, you can't do that. So I think what, do you, what do you think the rationale was, though, if you had to guess? Well, I know, I know, in the Edwardian time, because I've watched uh, Downton Abbey now, ah. all, all episodes, but there was the social aspect of 
of eating. And remember those people in that era were so wealthy. I mean, all they had to do was dinner was a pretty big event because right. there's nothing else to do and they had to get all dressed up. And so how dare you, I, how dare you use a dirty fork? Right. So, I, I can understand two forks. I get that. But why well, is the salad smaller? Well, so the tines of a piece of uh, the tines of a dinner fork were used to help stab the meat yes. and hold the meat as you cut. But the salad, you didn't stab your salad; you kind of s- scooped it a little bit, and and you had the tines to kind of pick up the radishes and that sort of stuff. But you were a gentleman or a lady; you scooped your salad; you didn't spear it. You weren't barbaric. How, yeah. how dare you use a dinner fork eating your salad? What kind of person are you? <laughs> Are you an Disgusting. animal? Disgusting. Anyway, so that was that was kind of a that's kind of a, a thing that we do from time to time when someone does something that's socially not acceptable. We'll go, hmm, salad fork. It's um, a recurring joke. Well, it's one that's lasted some time over twenty years, or well, not twenty years, probably. Should I ever dine at the yacht club with your your wife? I will be sure to use the wrong utensils. Yeah. For- for all my um... you should start picking your teeth with the shrimp fork. <laughs> That'd be awesome. That's a goofy looking toothpick they got here. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty nice. They put it over the top of the plate for you. Well, um, it helps. You know, we don't live that way anymore. Or um, drink the uh lemon juice. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's it's kind of a yeah, you know, I don't know how it is at your house either, but we I grew up in a house. My mother was a single was a an only child, but all of her aunts and uncles uh, were older people. And I don't think they had any children either, but we inherited all their furniture. So I, I grew up in a home. It wasn't like a, it wasn't like a hoarder, but she had almost every linear foot of wall space covered with some sort of piece of furniture. And it was tastefully done. Very, very tasteful. Um, but furniture wasn't furniture. They were people. You know, that, that sideboard was to go on to every every John Edward. That was the history behind that one piece of sideboard. That, that That's going to go to your brother because it was his. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, his name's right. John Edward, and he was named after his grandfather. Um, that piece of, that silver collection is going to go to your sister because it stays in the, you know, whatever the branch. And so we could never get rid of stuff. And so I, when I grew up to be an adult, I basically said, I, I'm not living that way anymore. I just want to, maybe a couple statement pieces to take with me. But we just don't live that way anymore. We I don't, don't like clutter. Yeah, and I always feel like in these, in that environment, it's just there's too much stuff in the room. So I, I'm, I'm a minimal one. minimalist. Minimalist, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't like that. But uh, no, my father's side of the family was pretty um i don't know what the right term is but they they like their pomp and circumstance around dinners Mm -hmm. so i was taught at a very early age the the what manners were acceptable and not acceptable at a dinner table and uh we learned to set the table in the proper you know the proper order the fork and the knife and the two yeah, the different forks and the salad bowl and all that kind of stuff where it goes on a place setting. Wow. So, and in my school system, we had to take home ec. Yeah, well, uh, there's a, there's a, at the county fair, there's a competition still. It's, I think it's called table settings. Hmm. And they, they break out. Is that of- where they stack the cups and bring them back down? <laughs> That's down around the corner. Uh, oh. But no, they still do that. It's just, you know, when, when we were at the club, um, we we thought it would be a neat thing to have. Have you been out to eat lately and had servers come around your table? Does anybody know how to be a server anymore? No, but I went to a pretty fancy steakhouse a couple times in the last year or two. And, you know, you get the, you that's old school there yeah. as far as service level goes how about the guy that shows up now <laughs> and they like you go to uh, a couple chains have these things where they got that computer that's on your table 
And oh, will you make your own order now and pay your uh, own bill and everything else? I think the last time I went to one of these places, I didn't put the order in, but they she came around and said, what can I get you for drinks? And what do you have? And so she took the order on a tablet. Yeah. And then um, when I said, you know, whatever, she she hustled bread and extra drinks. So she was pretty good about that. But then I was like, we're ready for the check. And she goes, no, no, it's on your table. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Aren't you going to bring me to it? She goes, no, it's right there on the table. Yeah. And so I had to, <laughs> I had to get the credit card out and, you know, do her job. Right, right. And, and, then, and then tip her. Tip her, yeah, yes. No, I, lo- I, I can't stand the automatic tip at a drive through I'm like, what what in the hell am I tipping you for? Well, so what was your rule? Okay, here's a little etiquette. Let's go. Um, you walk in, order your food, they hand you a number or a stanchion. You got to come back and get the food. Mm-hmm. You, do you tip that guy? No. Okay. Um you order the food, they hand you a stanchion, you go sit down. You order the food at the counter, hand right. you a, what I'm calling a stanchion. The little yeah, I know. What you're so it, they can see your number. Yeah. So you go back to your table. They run the food to you. Do you tip that guy? No. I think that guy used to get 10%. I, I As you know, I'm I'm a bit cheap, frugal. I'd say frugal. Okay. And... You know, I, I, in college, I, I had a couple roommates who were in the service industry and kind of changed my mind about tipping and, and so forth. But, uh, now it's gotten ridiculous now. Everybody that wants a tip. Yeah. And if you don't leave 20%, 20% is the old 15, I guess. Well, it was 10. I remember when I was, when I was a youth, uh, a ute. Um, uh, we used to go to Morrison's cafeteria. On Sunday after church. You remember that? You probably didn't know what that Yes, was. I know what okay. that is. Yeah. So we would go down the line, and Morrison's was a very Southern tradition. So they had black men and women, servers and waiters, and people behind the line. And, you know, the guy with the towel over his arm. Right. Very, very Southern. And I remember them coming to get our trays because you can't carry them when you're a little kid. And my dad would put a quarter. Ah. on each tray he, he the guy would slip past him he'd he'd have a handful of quarters he'd put a slide a quarter on the guy's tray and i remember thinking 25 cents then i would look around the room and go how many tables there are and how <laughs> doing many a little guys. calculation <laughs> and i'm thinking this guy's making 12 bucks today 12 bucks <laughs> now today what would that be you think how much is 12 bucks after 1970 well that's minimum wage for one hour right no, I mean he would. I figured he made about twelve bucks for the day. Well, I don't know. He he hustled, assuming everybody. Well, the quarter wasn't the only money he was getting. I hope. No, I'm. Well, shit, he made twelve cents. No, well, are you trying 12. to adjust for inflation? Yeah, hold on. Twelve divided times four. Yeah, twelve times four. That's forty-eight covers. So forty-eight people that he would hustle. That's probably about. Because not everybody gave him a quarter. So twelve bucks. Time, what is it? Ten. What are we talking about here? I'm How trying to adjust what... it for inflation. I don't know what it is. Oh. That'd be 120 <laughs> bucks. Does that seem right? He's, he's now today. He's making twelve fifty. I don't know. There's ten. Well, that's not, that's not bad. That we made hundred. I guess it's about right. One hundred twenty dollars in tips. What year was this? That twelve Seven, bucks was seventy two. I I don't know. On, uh, yeah, on. it can't be right. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, Alexa, here we go. How much? Hold on, Alexa, volume ten. Alexa, how much would twelve dollars and nineteen seventy two be worth today, adjusted for inflation? Sorry, I'm not sure. She's absolutely no way okay. she's getting this. Okay, hold on, Alexa. How much is twelve dollars and nineteen seventy two worth today? This might answer your question. Twelve U.S. dollars plus one thousand nine hundred seventy two is one thousand nine hundred eighty four U.S. dollars. Thank you, Alexa. <laughs> that was so wow. That guy is rich. Okay, hold on. <laughs> he was making more than your dad delivering kids' trays. Okay, hold on. 
1970 to $12 today adjusted for inflation. And okay, here, you... it here it is. I got it. $12 in 1972 is worth $88.33 yeah. today. Well, that wasn't bad. What do you mean? 88 bucks for eight hours work? The tips. So he made a dollar twenty-five an hour. Oh man, that is brutal. <laughs> well, I'm thinking back when I was a bartender, a hundred dollar day wasn't a bad day. Now that was a really good day. Yeah. Tip wise. Well, maybe you made more than twelve. Let's say so. Let's say let's say you made twenty bucks. This is just riveting conversation yeah, for yeah. Our, any any new listeners that we may be gain that we that we gained in the first five minutes of now. Uh, You're assuming they lasted that long. Yeah, <laughs> it drifted off. But hey, on that note, we need subscribers. We need some help from our our listeners. So in the bottom corner, I think this whole thing where it reverses our images, I think it's in that corner under you. Yeah. Well, over yeah. over there. No, the other side. No. The other side. No, over here. Back over here. No, so, over there. It's okay. no, it's down there. It Said subscribe. Click on it. Uh, uh, um, I beseech you to uh, subscribe. Well, what side am I on with you? I'm on this side. What do you mean you're on this side? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at my screen. I'm on the right side. Where are you? You got to face this way. Say, hey, Dave. How you doing? It's backwards. Yeah, now you got to look the other way. Right, I don't know, but this whole reverse image—I never, I haven't really figured it out yet. But when I was editing last week, I'm like, oh, I pointed to the wrong corner, so I think it's in the opposite when corner you below. Brush you. your teeth and do your hair. Do you get lost? Sometimes, yes. <laughs> Let's go. On. Sometimes I end up brushing my neck. Oh yeah, that happens. All right. Well, part of the problem tonight, in case our listeners don't know this, we don't know. We we rarely ever know what we're talking about. But usually we come one of us comes prepared with a story. I mean, I have some back stuff I can do, but one of the things I was thinking, and speaking of adjusting for inflation, and this may explain a lot. Um, if I can indulge you to tell us. So Dave Dave thinks he is such a savvy investor. Okay, that say he's, your part and then I'm gonna clean it up. Yeah. Dave thinks he's such a savvy investor that he can choose a portfolio that'll produce a 40% return. Mm. No. Okay. Okay. So let me give whereas, you. Whereas, and let me just eat you. Whereas the rest of the world averages around 10 or less. Well, just the market. Yes. Historically. The historically. Has made 9, 10%. Right. As do from, most investors. From 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 the very beginning of the market, if you're in the market from a historical standpoint, you you've covered nine ten percent. Yeah. Now I got to give you some some caveats here. Oh, say now this is what he didn't give me. No, no, before. no. I'm going to give now you now that setup. I'm now no, that I'm putting you I'm, to the to task. I'm not discounting what you said. I just want to give you how I got here. Historical context. I, I'm some of you may have heard this, but I'm, a, I'm not retired, but a former financial person in advisory role so i help people with their investments in the past and we should and, say right now we are by no way giving any financial advice i was going to get to that yeah so oh, anything, okay sorry i jumped so, in. so we in. advise you to consult your financial advisor or professional and do not take what we say as uh, the gospel or what you should do um and of course nothing uh, future results do not reflect past <laughs> or present. You're getting real deep. Recommendations. The, uh... so, and these are not recommendations, by the it's way. It's almost but... like you had to memorize this once in your yeah. prior life. Fire beware. All right. So I, I hope everybody understands that. So my f investment philosophy is buy and hold. And I'm not a timer, never believed in timing. But I believe the market will will carry nine to ten percent over time as if you're in it. And I believe in dollar cost averaging, which means to if you get two hundred dollars a month on the fifteenth, buy every month on the fifteenth two hundred dollars, and over time you'll have better return because you'll buy when the market's down more shares and it equals out. It does better that way. So dollar cost averaging is the thing to do. And over the past forty years, I've put aside a plan that's put my family in good shape. Now. Having said that, I thought at this point in my life, it'd be kind of fun to, to play around, gamble, 
for lack of a better term. Well, that's what stock. Well, that's a good you, point. Yeah, is legal so the market, gambling. There is some gambling, if you will, in the marketplace in the sense that it's a, a game of chance. But when you're in large stocks, you know, large cap and even the more publicized stocks, it's public information is readily available to more people. And so you really don't have a chance to affect change without most people knowing about it. And so the fundamentals of a company become very important and what, how are you going to choose profitability and all, all those good things that go into the fundamental understanding of a, of a company. Now, having settled that right now, we're living in an economy where I don't know what the hell's going on. I mean, there, there's a part of me that's like, none of this is making any sense. And so it supports really this next thing I was going to tell you early on in my career, one of my first jobs before I got solidified in the furniture business was a financial publishing company called Sound Money Investors, which was kind of a joke. But we were a publishing company. We had two magazines. One was called... Was this your music magazine? Well, this is about the same time I was publishing the music stuff. Okay. But that's why I was had this publishing bug that I got bit by. One was called Personal Investor. That, that was the normal people. Then the other one was called the sound money investor. And that's what we call the kooks, the people that were buying ostrich meat and burying gold in their backyard and all that stuff. Right. And right. so we, there's so a, you, that one was called sound money investor. Yeah. And so <laughs> there, there's a code in the, in the SEC code when you want to market a company, you want to promote it, that you can actually use stock. You can pay the marketing company in shares of stock up to a certain level. And so what these small cap, very micro small cap companies would do is hire us to write these puff pieces, if you will, right. uh, that gave financial data and get, told their story and had these great pictures and stuff. And then we would, this one fellow who, I think he ended up in prison or almost in prison one time, he would go out and arrange brokers, broker dealers and set up these, you know, where they would take down part of the market. And then we would have a mailing list where all these puff pieces would go out and we would market and tell their stories. So the whole idea behind these companies, they need financing. They need financing. And so you got to have someone tell us their story and kind of gins it up a little bit. And so you can have a, a place to have some capital raised. So would this be akin to going out and to like a venture capital firm and asking for money? But in well, sense, you're just, you're going to a broader audience. Well, the public square is where you're going. So the, right. the, there are brokers who make, who make markets. I mean, it happens in big stocks too. Yeah. You know, the Merrill Lynch's and, and the, the right. You pay them when you want to do an initial public offering, you generally Correct. go to one of these bigger firms. Correct. And solicit and the, their help. And these tiny companies don't people. They can't. Them. Yeah. Yeah. There's no way. So you go to people like that, what we were doing. And okay. so there's an element of this game going on that when you, you kind of throw out the fundamentals is what I'm trying to tell you. And they're legitimate companies. They're trying to do what they're supposed to do, but they're trying they to mean build, well, and, and they're trying to establish funding. They got to get their story out and all that sort of stuff. So there's more emotional stuff at play than there is fundamentals. And so I know that. And I thought this is kind of the space I wanted to be in. Now the, the two stocks I'm in right now, and I've chosen they're not pink sheets, but they're they're traded on the NASDAQ and they're on the New York Stock Exchange. So they're real companies. One of them's been around since 1920s, a gold mining company, gold and silver mining company out of the Chicago area. And the other one's a bio stock that makes a, a drug for cancer. And they're out of um, somewhere. North Korea. No, they're, and that was another thing. So I, I set some criteria. I wasn't going to deal with Chinese companies. Um. I wanted to deal with American-based companies, and I wanted to tr try to find someone on a on a decent exchange like a Nasdaq or a um, New York Stock Exchange. Now, I think we should tell people you got the bulk of your financial background from a, a gentleman by the name of Bernie Madoff. <laughs> His name was Bernie <laughs> Madoff. Madoff, and that man was Bernie Madoff. <laughs> No, no Bernie. Um, anyway, so the, here's the gist. I, I, I said, 
my target's going to be $2,000. I can afford to lose $2,000. That's the game. And so I will tell you this. I went to, I shopped around and I needed a, a, a place to do this. And so I, Fidelity is where I chose to, to open an account. And there's scads of other clearing houses that you Robin can... Hood, all of them. Yeah. Online. Yeah, I'm not I'm not promoting Fidelity, but I will tell you what I did. Um I opened what's called a Roth IRA. Now I'm 60. If you're younger than 55, your Roth IRA has some limitations on when you can access it. I thought it was a perfect idea because when I get tired of doing this, I'll be able to pull the money out without any ramifications. I thought you could pull out a Roth every time, but you don't get your capital gains or something, right? Yeah. So it's very complicated. Like, well, like I told my clients all the time, yes, you can access your contribution dollars, right? But go back to the IRS and try to explain to them which ones were contributions, which were gains and have a break it apart. Right. I mean that you're under 55. Right. So I don't want to get into the, the minutia of that. I'm 60. I opened a, another Roth. Um, Fidelity threw me a hundred dollar kicker. Really? If I, op- I opened an account with them and I kept, I think, I think $300 in the account for 90 days, then they would, they would spice the account for a hundred bucks. So I, right off the bat, I made a hundred bucks. So I thought, that's well, not huh, bad. That, that yeah. So sense. if you already made, uh, what's that? 30%? No. <laughs> Well, I mean, I put two grand in, so it doesn't matter. Well, I say that it's three. If you kept three hundred and you get a hundred. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, then, okay, you can keep it there. Yeah. Um. So, I've already had a learning experience. Um, of course, you have to buy in, in whole lots. So you have to buy hundred shares at a time, and so I'm actually pretty heavily invested in this bio uh, drug stock. I got fifteen hundred shares of that. Are you Are you willing to share the name? Um, I don't mind. Uh-huh. It's public companies. Yeah. Well, I just didn't know how, you know, so now one, everybody's going to jump on this stock and it's going to well, help you out. Know. So the one stock is um, Adicet Bio, A-D-I-C-E-T, Bio Inc. And the trading symbol is A-C-E-T. And, and the reason how I found these two companies, I, you know, I'm on the internet for hours at a time at night doing other things. And I said, well, let's just, Spend twenty yeah, thirty. You want to, you want to tell us what those other things are it's working? Um, <laughs> so I'll spend twenty thirty minutes of time doing some research. So I started off with you know Forbes giving me list of top companies to look for in two thousand twenty three and twenty four, and this was the Motley the, Fool. Motley Fool, and all those guys. Motley Fool is one of those companies I'm like I told you about. They're a financial publishing house, right? That either takes a market or gets paid in stock to promote, right? So if you know that going in, the fundamentals may or may not be so sound, but understand what they're doing. And there's public record to show you who yes. owns the shares. And if you, you're willing to dig into it, you got to yes. do that. You can't just crapshoot this thing. I used to tell my clients it's a participatory sport. I'll tell you in a minute how I kind of got to this. But anyway, so ACET is the bio stock. They have no sales. Okay. So they, they are trying to find a cure for um cancer with men's prostate all right and so they've got so you have a vested interest in their Uh, success well i hope they do (laughs) potentially Uh, potentially they have a t-cell i think they're trying to do exploit and if you know anything about drug research you've got to get the um the federal government's got to sign off on all your stuff make sure it's good that takes a long time yes and so you have to you have to scale up and they test and yeah yeah, so they've got to keep money. But here's the thing. They've got over 400, 400, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Maybe it's 200. It's it's several hundred million dollars in cash. And if you divide it by the outstanding shares, it's about a $6 shot stock. Okay. It's worth, if they had to go belly up tomorrow, it's six bucks a share. I bought it at $1.24, $1.27. So I feel like well, there's another. Why there's, is it increased though? Well, you know, these companies, they, they get good information along the way. They share right. it. You know, they're, have, they're, they're getting Or close. they pass a certain milestone. Yeah. Right. And, they become they get, less risky. Well, the no, sto- I guess that's not true. The story gets better. Right. And, and they're, all, they're all trying to hype all the good news they can. Right. Um, all right. Anyway, so that's that stock. The other stock is a gold mining and silver mining company called, I think it's Cure. 
It's that it's that it started off in that Idaho town that has the floating golf course, the French name Coeur de. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't know that's the name. I, I, I the only town I know is Boise, so I can't. Well, that's speak. where it started. C O E U R Mining Inc. and they've been around since about 1924. So before the depression, the Great Depression. So I wanted to find. Okay, they've been around a long time. Right. They've now moved their headquarters to Chicago. They own mines in Nevada, uh, Alaska, and I think they've got some interest in Mexico of all places. But here's the thing that makes sense. So we're getting the Aztecs, to... man, big gold miners. They know their gold. So we're getting ready to embark on. We've already been in a very high inflationary period. And so if you know anything about gold, it typically responds in inverse. Uh, it correlates to inflation. So mm-hmm. the, the price of gold goes up as inflation comes along as a hedge. And so this company has got some bad fundamentals, meaning they've got some really high expenses, but it's a, they produce. They produce silver and gold, and the price of silver and gold fluctuates, of course, with inflation and demand, especially silver but it's ever increasing. Here's what they're doing. They've been spending gobs of money over the last six or seven quarters on developing larger sleuth capacity. These yeah, things what, that you what catches process, the gold. Yeah, yeah what catches the gold. The ore. And so they're about done. This capacity that they're building is going to take them to three to six different, three to six times the level of dirt they're going to be able to put it in through the through the sleuth. right how much dirt they can move and right. they can process that more so gee i don't know gold silver prices are going up they've spent all this money to enhance their plant plant property and equipment it just seems to make sense that as long as the price makes sense for them to of course diesel's going up and all this other stuff too but there should be more yield more return have you not learned anything from the show gold rush dave the one kid with the, the yeah, Parker, yeah. yeah. You, you could build the the largest sluice box you, you box you want, Dave. But you know, there's always going to be a bottleneck in the process. Well, so now your dump truck, you're going to need extra dump trucks, extra ex excavators, more ground. Ground is running out. You yeah, know. no, no. It's it looks like it's a business that I don't want to be in, but but it, but it seemed to have some common sense to it, you know. And so they were highly touted in this top 40 list from Forbes. And so it got my attention. Well, things are moving. I think, I think what was the number I just showed you? So I'm at, I'm at 2000 invested. Of course, Fidelity kicked in a hundred for me for that, but I'm running. $2,100 is, is your, what do they call it? Par or something? Well, if you want to go against the, so I'm I'm sitting about twenty six hundred bucks right now. So twenty six hundred minus two thousand. Twenty one hundred. Okay, twenty six hundred minus twenty one hundred is five hundred dollars divided by twenty six hundred. So I'm sitting about nineteen percent return right now. Oh. And how long has this been going on? I opened the first account in September. All right. So, so I can make fun of you at some point when will it be a 40% return year over year? No, the 40% projection was, I like numbers and I like playing around with numbers. And so I just put together a glide path. What if, what if I could pull off 40%? What, what, what extrapolation would that look like? It turns out by the time I'm 68, I'll have $5 billion, $378 billion. <laughs> So I told my wife, said it's okay, honey. I guess yeah, we'll, we'll be we'll be safe, and we don't have to wait to five billion. We, we get to six hundred million. It's easy, street. right? Just, why get so, greedy, Dave? No, no, no. six hundred million, <laughs> give or take, <laughs> right? Home free. So that's the fun part. That's the silliness part. Um, if if I can continue, so my benchmark, my first benchmark is twenty eight hundred dollars by February twentieth. It's very, it's fluid. And so what's that'll be what 30% to 25%? What is that? I don't even know what that is. 2,800. So that's $700. Yeah. 
Thanks. I can't do the public math. From twenty one hundred fourteen. Right. So seven hundred dollars divided by twenty eight. Twenty one. No, twenty eight is the top. So that's twenty five percent return. All right. So that's not forty percent like you were bragging about. But annualized. All right. Oh, oh, and now we're going to annualize it. Okay. So if I could do that, let's say three times, that's seventy five percent return. All right. We'll see. Just like the guy who goes to Vegas and says, you know, I did invest in one of those once where I gave someone a thousand dollars for a, a twelve month period. And they had a, I'm using finger quotes for those listening at home, uh, an algorithm where he he was going to gamble the money. He would pay me a 30% return. Anything above earnings. that, it, it, anything above 30% belonged to him. I would only, I my cap was 30%. So uh, my year ran up and I said, where's my money? Um, took two or three phone calls and I got my $1,300 back, but he went out of business shortly thereafter. That's the Madoff team. Um, well, he, he had, he had a, what happened was I, it was a friend of a friend, right? So it was, it wasn't in deep, but what happened to him? He, he was Icarus, man. He flew too, too close to the sun. He had a core set of, um, and this is back. He had to go to Ve- move to Vegas to do this. You couldn't do it online as much as you could do it yeah. now, and or cross state boundaries and all that kind of stuff. He got greedy. Um, he was supposed to stick to just the core. You had to look for when, like in baseball, right? If you bet a game straight up, like uh, Mets versus Yankees tonight, uh, you know who's going to win, right? It, it, it varies based on the odds, but the what he would do is in a double header. If the Yankees won the first game, well, he would bet Mets the second game because very rarely does yeah. a team win both ends of a double header. And same thing with a a series. If if it was a three game series in baseball and the Yankees won the first two games, he'd bet Mets on the third game. Yeah. But he started pushing the rules too much, trying to win. It wasn't winning enough money for him because he, he promised the investors 30% return. Well, he wasn't getting 30%. <laughs> so he was getting greedy with the money and taking riskier bets. So years ago in the furniture business, we would travel. I had to go to uh, Memphis, Tennessee on trips like three or four times a year. Well, Memphis is just across the way from Tunica, Mississippi. Yep. The Tunica, Tunica, Mississippi is cotton fields. Um, sure or false? That's where tuna fish came from. Uh, false. Okay, um, you're right. Got so me. That, it's, there's a casino there on the river on a barge. Anyway, so it's a casino town. Yeah. And so we would stay there because it was cheap rooms. Of course, you, you lose it in the casino. Of course. But I started playing uh, roulette, which is the worst game of the house. I mean, the house wins all the time. But I came up with this system, and it and it worked. But there's no free lunch. You know, everyone thinks the gambling thing is just easy. It's work. It's just <laughs> like anything else. And so I remember one night, I always seem to win. I always, you know, I play, I don't know. What was your bucks. bet? What was your bet? Um, We played. I put 50 on black, 50 on red. I, 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 I was... break even every evening. That's how good I was. <laughs> No, I went in with about 600 bucks because I knew you had to have some stain. Oh, look at Rich Man over here flying well, into Tunica, Mississippi with 600 you, bucks. So you go <laughs> down, but you had to have some staying power. Ladies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> six yeah. Uh, they're free to everybody, Mr. D. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> anyway, so one night I was about eight. This is right before I got married. You know, when it's your money, Yes. You do what you want to do. You can make right. excuses for it, but it wasn't quite, we weren't married yet, but I had to go face the missus when I went home from this business trip. Well, I was $800 in the hole. Oof. And this is up at Council Bluffs this time in Iowa. And so I told the guy I was traveling with, I said, I, I can't go home $800 in the hole. I'm going to have to. <laughs> so I, better du- I better double down. <laughs> so I, I didn't go to bed. 
we had a flight that left at 5.30 in the morning. It was about 5 o'clock that night. He goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to the casino. And I'm going to work my way out of this. And and I worked for 12 hours. and got On the roulette out. table. On the So I had this system where I would place bets. And as soon as you went on the roulette table, you start thinking, hey, I could pay my rent. I could pay the car payment. And you keep playing. The secret to, that I thought that I won with was as soon as you won on the roulette table, get up. You got to get yes. away from it. And yep. you got to go take a lap or walk around, do something, but get away from the table. Well, I mean, that is the strategy of casinos. I always love my uh, my sister-in-law, uh, if she's listening, uh, uh, this is just, she was like, oh, I get free rooms. I'm like, yeah, there's a reason you get free rooms. There's no free lunch. <laughs> it helps you lose more money. Yeah. Helps so- get, they they know that the odds are in the house's favor. I, I, real quick story. I worked with a guy once who was a professional gambler back before it was a you know something cool to do and his his number one um rule was don't go with how much you can lose go with how much you're going to win and when you win that amount get up get and up leave. leave yeah it takes control and that's- yeah it's a difficult thing to do i made my wife do it one time she won several hundred dollars on a uh one of those poker machines yeah. And she's like, I want to keep playing. I'm like, no. No, that's when they get you. <laughs> you won. <laughs> you take your money and leave. Um, let's pivot here just for sure. a second. You didn't finish your story, so I'm sorry. You're 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 eight hundred bucks in hold. Did you did you Oh I got it back? Yeah. Okay. So well, I left with three hundred dollars up and I'm and I said I'm never doing that again. <laughs> uh that was the end of it. And and it was hard work. I mean, I yeah, I was hurting afterwards. Um on the gambling bit, let's move a little bit off of this. I don't know if you're noticing this, but you know how professional sports like baseball and, and football are really anti-gambling, especially the, the coaches and players. They don't want you to, to gamble. Yes, it, they are anti-gambling to the, the people that, who participate in the right. sport. But beyond that, they're all about it. Yeah, ask Pete Rose. Um, right. <laughs> but the, the, I'm noticing now you can't watch a football game I watched I watched the first NFL I've watched in three years this past weekend, and there was like ten gambling commercials. Yeah, like heavy, heavy push the gambling. Well, it's been legalized online across state lines now. Is that the barstool guy that did that? I don't know who who uh, went for it, but it's kind of funny. I can't remember which way it went here, but you know, as as a person who worked in the cellular industry we had to limit if you could use these apps based on which state you were in so people would drive to the south part of charlotte so they could get on a south carolina tower and do their gambling and then come back up into the state to uh to watch the games you know so i just think it's it's not criminal but it's i i just it pains me the NFL, you know, doesn't want anybody to gamble, but they, they don't have any problem taking the gambling money from the from well, the- from the yeah, from the uh, from the casinos who want to advertise. Yeah. yeah, but if you think about it, that, that is capitalism, though. In a in a nutshell, I mean, all these companies are selling you something, whether it be tangible or not, and and asking for money, right? Uh, okay. It- Sure. I'm not, a, I'm a capitalist. I'm not right. against free markets or free capitalism. I'm just saying it, it just pains me. You hear about the, um, the NF again, you can't, you, you, you can't go to the hall. Pete Rose can't get in because he was a gambler, but well, but, it wasn't so much that he gambled. He gambled on his own game. Well, but I mean, what's the difference? I mean, it's kind of like the federal government saying, you can't smoke cigarettes, but we're not going to outlaw them because we get the tax revenue off of them. You know, it's it, it's just, I get spun up on these small details. It's like hypocrite, you know. Hypocrite well, the idea was, it. well, what was funny about Pete Rose is he was, he his bets were always on him winning. It wasn't him losing, which he could have affected a game, but you can't make yourself win. Well, maybe that was his justification. I don't know the man, but I mean, to, right. to, well, I, I don't think he was a pillar of society by any means, but uh, it is, I, I think, it, it, to your 
to agree with you somewhat, I do think it's a little hypocritical that he's not allowed in the Hall of Fame. I really don't care. I mean, I I can't watch well, baseball on TV. I, I like going to the park, but it's like watching paint dry on TV. So. It's it's gotten very. It's this whole idea. Uh, people argue they always want a pitcher's duel. I'm like, what is fun about a pitcher's duel? A pitcher's duel. Duel. Oh, Whereas duel. it's basically there's been two hits in a, nine innings. You know. Yeah, there's so much parody in the game to get an earned error. <laughs> It's amazing well, anybody can get a score out of anybody. I used to, you know, I worked again. I was in broadcasting. I worked uh, double A games, and the, these are those are fun. They are, but there was a dark side to it. You mentioned the error thing, and so so the guy in the booth was basically paid minimum wage to, to keep score, you know, official score. And when a ball was booted or or something, he had to make the call. Was that an error or not? And so if he put error in a book and the the player would see the E come up on the scoreboard, oh, man, after the game, they would come up there and just rail against, you know, because that showed up on their record. Yeah, that kept them from going to the to the dance. Yeah, it could it could theoretically play into their you know their future salary, and so poor guy, man, he just get reamed out. But plus, he if a if a pitch got past the catcher, was it a bad pitch or was it a, a catcher's fault? And he had to make these deter you know spur the moment determinations. He's just a regular Joe. Keep you know enjoyed you know make three fifty an hour keeping score for the Orlando Twins. Yeah. Okay, let's extrapolate one more layer. And and by no means we you've we've talked meat has talked football before, but I, I'm I'm so far out of it now, what's going on. But the recent news about FSU, are you following yes. any of this stuff? Yeah, oh yeah. So it's, it's funny when the news came out that the, the week of my wife was walking around and it's UCF all over again, UCF all over again. <laughs> and and I'm like, what's going on? I was so far out of it. And then I did my research and realized what had happened. I said, well, the, the difference at that time was UCF was not a BCS team. No, but no. they had an undefeated season. So, right. and they played marginally yeah. decent, but team. FSU, you know, yes. SEC title undefeated. Yep. They sh- so, immediately my mind starts thinking what's the motivation so is it oh god you know what it is well i think i've got it figured out is it is it a political thing where they're saying screw you desantis in florida we're going to show you probably not no but the the money in the game now for these guys that are that are labeled by these you know nikes or whoever sponsoring these guys well if alabama has got a bunch of those kids on their team then someone at the head office is saying, we're going to need these guys on TV because we want well, the, the coverage. It's a it's a predetermined Super Bowl, essentially. They're saying, hey, we get to pick the teams that are going to generate the biggest ratings. Not who deserves to be the top four, but who's going to give us the biggest ratings? Yeah, and if I'm paying this kid $20 million or something like that, then right. I need to get my return on my investment. So. Have we not screwed the game? Has Oh, it was screwed once we went to a playoff. It was screwed. Wow. I loved it. I tell people this all the time. I think it should go back to everybody plays their bowl games and we argue over who's the best football team around it. You know, I'll ask you do, you, do you know who the national champion was last year in football? Georgia. Yes. Did you guess? I mean, to some degree. I think I remember because it's right. But the point is, if if Georgia and Alabama hadn't played each other in the final, I don't even know who played in the final last year. I was it couldn't be Georgia, Alabama. I don't think it was Georgia and someone else. If they hadn't played each other and we argued about who was number one, that argument would still be fresh in your head today. Yeah. You know, just like the UCF year, maybe it has a little bit to do with the fact that. But I can mention that year to people, and they always go, oh, you mean where UCF thought they were champions? I'm like, yes. You know, you remember that. But when there's a definitive winner through a playoff system, no one cares. Well, but back in the 70s, they didn't have that. We no, had- that's what I said. It was great. You'd get up. Every bowl game mattered because yeah. it, it played into the equation of who was going to be ranked number one at the end of the bowl games. Yeah, when the Orange Bowl I, was played, New Year's Day the night, 
that was yeah. the winner. Yeah. You would say, okay, after all today's game, you know, Alabama beat Clemson and but Clemson had beat Georgia and Georgia lost to so and so who Alabama beat. And you say that's why Alabama's number one. And there would be this argument all most right. of the time there was always a couple of people arguing for you know, accelerated teams. Yeah, and that was the fans arguing for their team, but now right. we're talking the bowls are so much money from a ah, it's, just, it's gotten out of hand. And yeah. the sponsorship of these kids playing. Now those corporations are like, we got to get our people on the, on the TV to get our money back and, and get our right. exposure. And, and look, I'm a capitalist again, but this is where we get ourselves in trouble. We're going to screw that. We're going to, we're going to kill the golden egg, the golden yes. the goose that lays the gold. Absolutely. Egg. will. it's just criminal. I mean, I just, I get so tired of this and, and they don't, it's, it's like anything else we do in business. Uh, I tell people, Anytime we get some form of new technology, emails, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. But then some guy gets a hold of it and says, wait a minute, we can get our message to these clients. We're going to send about 8 billion emails over and over and over again. And now people are like, if you send me another email, I don't know. <laughs> you know so now they're useless. The same thing with text messaging. Fast. Anything that can be monitored. The, the internet is slowly, oh, it, they, they figured out how to monetize it now and it's it's ruining it. Um, unfortunately, and and what also happens in a capitalist society is that when the market's saturated, right, you you've either got to start monopolizing the market, right? Because we we insist we're not happy anymore with uh, dividends, right? That's not sufficient. Your stock has got to grow. You know, there's no more blue chips anymore. Yeah, I always I always said. Um... I think I've told the story, but when my dad came home and this new thing they had was this IRA and, oh, yeah. um, you know, he could put $1,200 a year or something like that in the very beginnings of these things, $2,000, whatever it was. And I said, this is the end. He goes, what do you mean? I said, because the individual investor has no idea what the hell they're doing. Uh, the individual investor is going to be standing at the gates with pitchforks and, you know, ax handles saying, where's my return on my investment? Because they have no idea what it takes to the long the length of the investment cycle and the length of how to get a business up and running. So they're going to be demanding a return on investment and the corporations are going to need the funding and they're going to have to respond ESG and all this other nonsense we're doing. So because screw the cost, oh, that's a whole other thing. It's going to be, right. angry. look, I, I'm capitalism, free market all the way. Uh, yeah, I, I too. But I think we have to remember we have a responsibility to be good stewards in all things we do. And it's always that guy that screws up the apple cart. You know, it's always that one greedy son of a gun who's going to get his and it screws up everybody. I always tell, I always tell people I love reading the a HR manual, especially about travel uh, when you first join a company, because there's always a strange rule in there that you're like, why? And, it, and then it, it clicks at me. I'm like, because somebody tried that, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, it was always, I always love the one, you know, uh, massages are not an expensable, <laughs> you know, <Not> anymore. <laughs> they were after Bob, Bob, Bob got one and he got, he got on his bill and he didn't want to pay for it. So he tried to expense <laughs> it. So, and, uh, the pay-per-view movies are always, <laughs> you know, things, it just cracks me up to read the, uh, what's allowed in travel. Huh. So, and that's why we have so many laws, right? Because someone tries it, and then you have to create a law to stop that from happening again. Because we're not humans, or I don't want to limit it to just capitalism, but it. Well, we're, you know, we're, money. We're sinful, man. Yes, we're we, all we get greedy, and we have to make more money and try to do different things and earn it a different way. And you know, I like the Bernie Madoffs that we I made fun of earlier, right? You know, it, it, no one can, well, and, and it's kind of why I brought him up is that whole 40% thing. He was delivering what, 20, 30% rate of return for 15 years or something. And everybody's like, oh yeah, he's the best. You know? Do you think he, do you think he slept well? I don't know. At, at a certain point, don't you think he starts to believe in his own abilities? Like, hey, I've been doing it this long. Well, I, you know, he lived 
from the from the properties he owned he you know he didn't live like a pauper he had a pretty no nice not at all but i don't know if that was part of the shtick you know did he have to did he justify that because he had to have that lifestyle to sell the grandeur that he was on top of his world but in his heart of you know in his heart of hearts was he just like a train wreck inside like oh my god they're gonna find me out or did he just it didn't know, seem people, like it once he got caught it was and malice the whole way. I'm just going to get mine and screw everybody else. I um, I have to think that. And same with that latest guy with the cryptocurrency, Sam. I think that guy Rickman, was Freud or Freed or whatever his name was. Or whatever it was. Right. I mean, as a general rule in investing, never buy anything you don't understand, right? Well, that makes sense. Um, I don't know. Every time I watch the news and somebody does something bad, I'm like, what an idiot. I wouldn't have done it that way. I would have done it that <laughs> it way. Just- and then you say to yourself, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's why they're criminals. <laughs> exactly. They they're are. lazy. That's what I always say. But uh, well, listen, we better we better start thinking. We're getting close to the end here, and it's barista training night here in uh the Woody household. Barista. Of, uh, yeah, I know. That's where well, that oh. was the steaming of the milk sound. Oh, is that what that was? Oh, I can't believe I missed that one. That yeah, was so on point. House. You had a what? We had a coffee house. What are you talking about? I I owned a coffee house. It was called Sarah's Coffee. Mm-hmm. Six years. So I had a fr- I had an Italian made um, cappuccino machine. Cappuccino machine. The big with five heads. It was beautiful. And where where was this? Oh, in Baker County. And why'd you close shop? Wrong place, wrong time. Oh, so it it wasn't profitable enough. Uh, two thousand nine. Remember that little date? Yeah, two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Well, that was the banks were tanking, but uh... well, we had we sold eighteen. We had a gimmick. We sold an eighteen dollar. No, yeah, eighteen dollar eight ounce eighteen ounce pound, not sixteen ounces, but it was. Wait a second. Say this again. We sold an 18-ounce pound for $18. Pound of what? Coffee. Whole bean coffee. Oh, so you weren't... It wasn't like a Starbucks where no, you we were had, serving. We had a, we had a okay. coffee house with a listening room with, the, you know, play jazz and... Okay. It was All a right. really cool place. Just yeah. Place at the wrong time in, in 2008 and 2009. All right. So people couldn't... Okay. They, they were cutting back spending. You know, the frivolous spending. Yeah. I see McDonald's is getting in the coffee house biz now. I don't go to co- I don't go to McDonald's anymore. Well, they're going to open a new store called McCosmic, I think McCos, and it's going to take on Starbucks and the uh, pen- not Panera's. Um, what's the other big coffee place? Did you see the CEO about Panera's real quick? Oh, with the lemonade stuff. Well, there's yeah, there's that, oh. but no, um, he said that. Uh, the new generation of workers don't care about shareholder value. <laughs> and so when they go into the meeting, like, come on team, we gotta, we gotta do right. Oh, oh, well, I don't think they understand it. Well, it's funny because I was at Panera's about six months ago. And, um, <laughs> I did the, I did. Did the, you use the salad fork to eat your dinner? I was a, I was right? a kin. My wife said I was a kin. So this guy, this homeless looking, I mean, he, was, he wasn't homeless looking, but he was a, a young guy and he's stretched out across one of the banquettes asleep under the table. Oh, in this, in the, in the in store. The side. And okay. I'm having a meeting with someone. And I'm like, look, what is this guy doing? You know? <laughs> and so I call the kid over wiping tables and I said, you know, what gives? Does <laughs> what he, gives? Does he, does he work here and he's on a shift? <laughs> he's taking a break. He goes, no, I got in work here. And I said, don't you think you should go Shoe him along and move yeah. him along? He goes, no, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> don't want to do that. I, I don't. I, that's above my pay grade, sir. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he wouldn't do it. And I'm like, you think that's good for other customers to see that? I mean, is this, is this a hotel you're running or a restaurant? <laughs> he goes, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to bug you. And I'm like, what, what kind of person are you? I said, go get your manager. And he goes, why oh, do you Lord. do that? And I said, because I'm a shareholder. Go get your manager. <laughs> well, she didn't come over and talk to me, but she went over and rousted him and said, you, you can't sleep in our store. 
Right. But the CEO of Panera says, our staff doesn't care about shareholder value anymore. So they're not working for the man, apparently. Uh, I don't know. I had a thought they'd go off of that. Now I can't can't remember. But I, I always think that's a big thing. I don't think a lot of people understand. You know, they give out uh, stock in your 401ks and everything. I don't think anybody under, uh, has understands just how much influence they have on a stock price as individuals. I mean, I we can know. discuss that uh, another day because yeah. we, we are running up on, on top yeah, of the I hour. don't know. Things are so upside down. Um, all right. So let's make a commitment that we're not going to oversell this stock thing, but I don't mind checking in every once in a while. No, yeah. I, I want to make fun of you. So we're definitely going to check in when you're down, when you're down at single digit growth. I'm not, I'm not doubting you. You can grow your portfolio. I just yeah, doubt you can do a, a 40. See, let's, let's make it a class project and see how it does. We don't have to make fun well, of look, it. I'll, I'll pick a stock. Um, I'm going to pick uh, Berkshire Hathaway Class A shares. He's, sell, he's selling the cash. Well, his buddy died. When do you think he's going to retire? Well, what's his name? His partner just died. That's what I just said. I said his buddy died. Oh. I what do you that. think I was talking about? That guy was that guy was kind of fun to listen to. Yeah, 99. I own Class B shares at Berkshire Hathaway, by the way. How much is that trading at? A couple hundred now. I think I bought it when he first issued it, like in the 50s or he something like that. pissed me off one time. So I was, some time ago, Fruit of the Loom was, <laughs> was taking it in the shorts. <laughs> they were hurting. And um, I'm thinking, Fruit of the Loom, but the brand alone's got to be worth something, right? Right. So it was in a spiral. This is before I knew much about the market and what things were doing. You know, it, it was, was getting, in the crapper. It was getting shorted. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it was it was in the dollars. And I'm like, buying this. I'm buying a thousand shares. There's no way this is going to go bad. Right. Well, I didn't, I didn't do my homework. And Buffett purchased it and, sh- and shorted it all the way down to nothing. So he shorted the stock. He didn't yeah, buy he it. T- he took it down to zero. Wow. And, and he, and he, then he had the brand. So the right. company, he, he sold off all the, you know, the production and assets and everything else, but he owned Fruit of the Loom. And about six months to a year later, he relaunched it. There you go. Took it Man's to China probably and, and had it all made over there. But the stock I held was was worthless. I think I had, a, it was a dollar. I think I had a thousand dollars I lost. I held a stock till it got to zero once. <laughs> That's a good ride. Yeah, it was. Oh, it's coming back. I yeah, swear. well, that was what I thought. I didn't want to say it was very early in my investment career, and I'm like, no stock goes to zero. That's did impossible. You the, did you get the paper printed? They goes, we, we can't do that because we're about <laughs> out of business. <laughs> you might as well burn that paper and keep your hand warm. That's about as good as good as that is. So, anyhow, all right, let's wrap this up. All right, uh, I don't know what we're going to call this one, but I'll listen to it and then okay. I'll do my version. You do yours. Sure. Um, you'll remember, the- people, subscribe on YouTube, please. Yeah, come on. And enough with just listening for yeah, free. I'm not begging. I'm just, we're going to come through the glass now. It's time. Get Just push the dang button. I mean, what does it really involve? What, what are we talking here? Cost you love- nothing. Yeah, absolutely. This but a good time. You get a good time out of it, for goodness sakes. Yeah, and if you can't, we'll put you to sleep. All right. There you let's go. Get out I'm Dave. I'm Woody. And you've been listening to an incredible episode of We Can Help with David and Woody. We'll see you next time.